Have you ever been confused by the difference between type 1 and type 2 diabetes? Or even wondered what type of diabetes you have? If you have, you're not alone. Welcome to Sugar High Guys, I'm PA David, and as always, I'm your glycosylated guide through diabetes. So the goal of this video is to answer the question, what is the difference between the different types of diabetes? Let's talk about them, how to know which one is which, what causes them, and what we can do about each one. As always, we're gonna stay away from all the big, dumb, technical, fancy words and boring biochemistry, but this should give you a pretty good and general understanding of what differentiates the different types of diabetes and how each one works. So let's get going on this episode of Sugar High. common questions I get asked by new diabetic patients is, what type of diabetes do I have? You've probably heard that there are two main types of diabetes, and that's true, but the truth is there's actually a bunch of different types of diabetes that come from different causes. But some of these are more rare, and there's really only three main types of diabetes that most people fall into. And these are type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, and gestational or pregnancy-related diabetes. Those more rare types I mentioned often get lumped together in this fourth other types category, and they include something called MODI, which stands for Mature Onset Diabetes of the Young, LADA, which stands for Latent Autoimmune Diabetes of Adulthood, steroid-induced diabetes, and secondary diabetes, where the diabetes is actually caused by some sort of other medical condition. I think I'll make another video about those later to talk about those more rare types. So for this video, let's just cover the big three uh, so that that'll cover most people's questions without letting the episode's length get out of control. So let's start with type one diabetes. Don't you think that's a little over dramatic? No? All right, fine, but that's on you. So in a nutshell, Type 1 diabetes is the inability of your body to make adequate amounts of insulin. Now in this video right here, I discuss how insulin normally works to control blood sugar, uh, but just to summarize, insulin is the hormone that serves as the key to unlock the door that lets glucose enter a body cell. If insulin is missing, the door stays locked and the glucose can't get into that cell and ends up stuck in the bloodstream, where the levels of that glucose build up and build up and build up. Someone with type 1 diabetes loses the ability to make a normal amount of insulin because the cells in the pancreas that create insulin, called beta cells, get destroyed. And the crazy thing is, it's your body's own immune system that destroys them. Now, this can happen for a lot of different reasons, but one of the most common causes is in response to an infection. When you get an infection, the immune system job is to fight the virus or the bacteria that's causing the infection and kill it off so that we can get better. In a lot of type 1 diabetics, the immune system ends up attacking not just the virus, but also the beta cells. So you might be wondering, why in the world would your own immune system kill pancreas cells? I mean, it's supposed to kill invaders like viruses, right? It's not supposed to kill your own cells. But to better explain that, I think I should grab my kids. This, this might help. Hold on, let me go get these guys. Where is this kid at? Hey, you. What? Hey, put that on. Why? Because I need you to help me. What? Yeah. I'm, I'm in the middle of something. No, you're going to be a white blood cell. Yeah, see? You look fantastic. Perfect. You excited? You excited to be white blood cell? Not really. No? Hey, put these on. You gotta wear that. I need you to be a beta cell. Wow. Yeah. Why? What? Because you're, cause you're the beta cell. Trust me, I'll explain. When we get sick, viruses invade our body and start attacking target cells. The immune system senses this and starts attacking the virus.
sometimes, in the heat of the moment, the immune system gets carried away and starts attacking things that were never meant to be attacked. Now we're diabetic. So what can we do about this? Well, for right now, the only thing we can really do about a situation where you're missing insulin is to replace the insulin. Insulin's traditionally given by injection, but is more and more commonly being given through easier routes like insulin pumps and even inhaled insulin. If a type one diabetic person is getting insulin through injections, they'll normally need two different kinds. One to last all day as a background insulin, we call that basal insulin. And a short acting insulin to keep the blood sugar from going too high after meals, we call that a bolus insulin. Bolus insulin is the type that's also available in an inhaled form. Check out my video on fast acting insulins, including one called a Frezza, if you're interested in learning more about that. Another way that insulin can be delivered is through an insulin pump. Insulin pumps are used just fast acting insulin, but it accomplishes the same background and mealtime dose concept that we just talked about with injections. The pump trickles in this small amount of insulin all day long, which we call the basal rate. Get it? Just like basal insulin when we were talking about injections. And then when the person is gonna eat something, they can give that extra little squirt of insulin to cover for the meal. But instead of having to give another injection, they just have to press a few buttons where they tell the pump the amount of carbohydrates that they're gonna eat and their current blood sugar level. The pump then uses that information to calculate this custom amount of insulin and delivers it through the tubing instead of a shot. That's nice, right? So if you're interested in learning more about insulin pumps, definitely check out my videos on those. I'm gonna be reviewing each one. We're gonna talk about the positives and the negatives of each of the major players uh, in the insulin pump market. Give you my thoughts, might even try one on for a couple of days. As far as the future of type one diabetes treatment, there's a lot of research going on right now and I honestly believe that we're gonna see some really incredible developments in our lifetimes. Future treatments are more focused on preventing type 1 diabetes or even curing it through developments in immunotherapy, vaccination type technology, stem cell therapy, uh, beta cell transplantation, and genetically identifying people at risk of type 1 diabetes and protecting those beta cells before they ever get destroyed in the first place. All right, now let's switch gears and talk about type 2 diabetes. Sure that's not too, no, okay. Type two diabetes is actually the world's most common form. Somewhere between like 90 and 95% of all diabetics have type two diabetes, only like five or 10% are type one. Originally type two diabetes was just thought of as the body becoming resistant to insulin, as in the insulin is still there, but the body stops responding to it. So you remember that lock and key analogy we used earlier? In type one diabetes, the key is missing. No key, still got a good lock, but no key. But in type two, the key's still there, but the lock is broken. So you still can't open the door because it won't turn. Now that's a super simplified way of describing it. And all of that's still true, but in recent years, we've actually learned that this is only one part of a whole collection of things that goes wrong in type two diabetes. It turns out that there's a bunch of metabolic processes that help control sugar and even beyond just insulin letting glucose into the cell. There's another hormone called glucagon that gets made by the pancreas and that hormone raises glucose levels if it gets too low. Your kidneys even help manage sugar because they can release extra glucose into your urine, letting you pee out that extra sugar if the level gets too high. There's a hormone called GLP-1 that gets released by your intestine during a meal. You eat something and out it squirts. And that hormone assists the beta cells production of insulin. It slows down how fast your stomach empties your meal into the intestine for the nutrients to get absorbed. And it tells the brain to make you feel less hungry so we know when it's time to stop eating. The liver also plays a role in controlling sugar levels too because it stores glucose inside it 
and it can release it. It can release that sugar when the glucose levels drop and it can hold on to it when the glucose levels are too high. And there's other mechanisms at play as well. Well, in type two diabetes, all of those mechanisms we just talked about that your body uses to uh, keep sugar levels at normal levels, pretty much break. And things that used to bring your sugar level back down, now let them go up. The liver cranks out extra sugar even though the level's already too high. The GLP-1 system that we talked about from your intestine doesn't work as well as it used to. So you still feel hungry even though you're already full. The body cells aren't as sensitive to insulin as they used to be. The pancreas makes glucagon to raise sugar even when it's already high. It's not supposed to do that. The kidneys that are supposed to release extra sugar actually hold on to it longer and don't let it go until the sugar level reaches an even higher threshold than it used to before. And on top of all that, the beta cells in your pancreas that make insulin eventually start to fatigue and they fail and they die off. So now we're lacking insulin altogether, which is why even type two diabetic people oftentimes need insulin to keep their sugar normal as well. So you can see how this is a much more complex situation that has more metabolic problems leading to the sugar going up. And what's really the problem is that the start of this is usually really slow and gradual. So much so that people usually don't even notice that anything's wrong until the diabetes has been there untreated in the background for years. Okay, so what can we do about type two diabetes? Remember that with type one, the answer was just replace the insulin that's missing, right? Well, with type two, since there's so many different things going on that cause the sugar to go up, we have a bunch of different treatment options as far as how to treat it. We have all sorts of different medications that we can use in addition to just insulin to bring your sugar back down. Remember that list that I told you about where all of the things go wrong with type two diabetes? Each medicine that we have is designed to address specific parts of that list of defects and we'll oftentimes use multiple medications together in order to try to approach the blood sugar from multiple angles. You get it? So if you've ever wondered, like, why did my healthcare provider prescribe me more than one medication? Why do I need more than one pill? It's probably because he or she's trying to nail multiple areas to improve your glucose. One medication might be to help your muscles absorb glucose better and tell your liver not to make as much sugar. Another medication might be fixing that kidney problem where they hold on to glucose longer than they should and the medicine lets you pee out the extra sugar. Another medication might be adding more of that GLP-1 that we talked about earlier so that the whole system works better. And then of course, as I mentioned earlier, there's insulin, which many, many type two diabetics also need, not just type one diabetics. We're not gonna get into all the details of each different types of medication in this video because it would go on forever, okay? But I have other videos where I talk about all the different types of medications. We're gonna go through different categories. We're gonna talk about what they do, how they work, what the benefits to each one are, what the side effects are to each one. Uh, we'll talk about the cost. We're gonna get into a lot of details. So if you're interested in the specific medication that you might be taking and you wanna learn more about it, check out my channel, look at my list of episodes. How much you wanna bet you find an episode that talks about a medication that you're taking. So the last type of diabetes that I wanna talk about today is called Gestational Diabetes. Gestational diabetes is a temporary form of diabetes that happens in a pregnant woman who didn't have diabetes before she was pregnant. This happens in somewhere between like three to 9% of pregnancies. And what's really crazy is that we still don't even really fully understand why it happens. But it's basically a temporary resistance to insulin caused by the huge set of hormonal changes that happen during pregnancy. So it's kind of like a temporary version of type two diabetes that normally goes away after the baby's born. So this doesn't normally have any symptoms. Remember, it's a short-term diabetes, so we have to actively look for it in pregnant moms. If you've ever had a baby, you probably had to do that glucose tolerance test at some point, usually between like 24 to 28 weeks of pregnancy. And the idea behind the glucose tolerance test is to see how well mama's body can handle or tolerate a bunch of glucose coming in all at once. If everything works like it should, she drinks that stuff down, and then even if the blood sugar goes up a bit, her insulin ought to bring the sugar back down to a normal level within an hour or so. 
But if she's developing gestational diabetes, then the glucose levels go up and stay up. Get it? So here's a question. If this is just a temporary form of diabetes that goes away when the baby's born, I mean, that's just a few months, right? Why should we even care? Well, it turns out that even in that short period of time, high blood glucose levels during a pregnancy can actually cause some real problems. Gestational diabetes is associated with large birth weight of the baby, which will increase the chance of needing a C-section. Uh, it can increase the risk of preeclampsia. It can cause hypoglycemia or low blood sugar in the newborn baby. It can cause a greater chance of jaundice in the newborn and a greater chance for both mom and baby to develop actual type two diabetes later on in life. So if an expecting mom has gestational diabetes, we try really hard to keep the blood sugar levels as perfect as we can get them throughout the whole pregnancy. The higher the blood sugar, the greater the chances of all of those complications happening. There's all sorts of medications that we have for treating type two diabetes, but as you can imagine, we're pretty limited with what we can use during pregnancy. because we don't wanna risk any harm to the baby. And most of these newer medications that we have have never been tested in pregnancy and not a lot of expectant moms are willing to experiment like that on their own baby. So in addition to a really good diet where we limit the sugar that comes in and the carb intake into mom's body, the preferred medication for treating gestational diabetes if she does need medication is insulin. Insulin has been studied during pregnancy and it's shown to be the safest option. And that makes sense if you think about it because I mean, think about it. insulin is something that belongs in your body naturally. It's the only medication that we have that you make every day. Insulin is something that moms already make. So it's not too surprising to find out that the babies do fine when they're exposed to insulin. Metformin is also commonly used during pregnancy as well. And there's actually a pretty fair amount of evidence that uh, the risks of the baby is really low with metformin as well. So there you go, that's your crash course on how the majority of diabetes cases work. I hope you found this information helpful and have a better understanding of the differences between what differentiates type one, type two, and gestational diabetes. If you found this video helpful, please give it a like and make sure that you hit that subscribe button so that you can keep getting more information that'll help you out even more. If you wanna know more about managing diabetes, living with diabetes, checking your blood glucose, or even eating as a diabetic, please check out my other videos. All right, question of the day. How does living with diabetes affect your daily routine? And how does having a better understanding of how diabetes works help you to approach it? Leave your answer in the comments below. I am looking forward to learning all about your experiences. I will talk with you again in the next episode of Sugar High.